Good. So we'll just, I'll just go through today. I'll start off just talking a, a little bit about meditation practice in general, uh, just some very simple instructions, uh, and then we'll get into the, uh, the suttas later on there. Uh, but before I do that, just the, uh, this is the, uh, the schedule that you have seen. Uh, there's only one change I would like to make to this schedule, and that is it says uh, guided meditation in the morning from 8 to 8.30 a.m. Uh, that will just be an ordinary kind of walking or sitting meditation. Uh, there won't be any guiding at that time. The guiding will be in the evening. Uh, there will be three guided meditations today, tomorrow, and on, on Sunday. That's the only, so if you can note that for yourself, that is clear. Everything else should be fine, roughly, yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, let us start. So just a, uh, first of all, just uh, uh, the purpose of coming to a place like this. Uh, it's important to keep this in mind for these three days. Uh, Three days goes past very quickly here. Uh, so keep in mind the reason why you're here. Uh, and the reason why you're here is basically just to relax, to take it easy. Uh, it's almost like to enjoy yourself if you like, uh, but enjoy yourself in a wholesome way, right? Uh, in a good uh, Buddhist way. Uh, that's the purpose of this retreat. Uh, so make sure you do that. Make sure you don't sort of tense up or you become uncomfortable and all these kind of things. Uh, because sometimes people have this idea that uh, when you go on retreat, if you are kind of tough-minded and you really, you know, you kind of use a lot of willpower and force, then you're going to make progress in meditation practice. But usually, it doesn't really work like that. So make sure that you enjoy yourself. And it's such a beautiful uh, retreat center here. When I come over from the monastery, it's always very nice to come over here. It's nice at the monastery as well, of course, but it's always nice to come over here too. A very uh, beautiful setting. So just enjoy the peace of the place, right? Feel good, feel relaxed, feel at ease. And when you are just tuning in to the kind of the stillness and the peace uh, and you start to feel really at uh, peace yourself and you feel at ease and you feel relaxed and you start to enjoy yourself uh, then you have a good time. Uh. It lo it's very over very quickly, it's only two days uh, and it, you can do a lot in two days uh, but it's also short at the same time. So it's like a good way of getting started, getting into these things. Uh, uh, and when you remem remember that you only have two days then you, uh, you spend your time wisely while you're here. Uh, neither becoming stressed intense nor kind of, uh, you know, uh, thinking about all the stuff of the world. So please use your time well. And the purpose of this retreat, it's uh, called the Sutta retreat, but the purpose really, from my point of view, is that uh, when you read the suttas, the suttas contain a lot of information about meditation practice. Not just meditation, of, of course, also much broader than that. Uh, but very often when we talk about meditation, we have this teacher, we have that teacher. But very few people actually take the suttas as a guideline for how to practice the path, how to practice meditation. It's one of those funny things, you know, people say, oh, my teacher is uh, my, this sayado or that sayado or this ajahn or that ajahn or this uh, uh, vipassana teacher or that vipassana teacher or, or ajahn brahma or whatever. But how many people say that the Buddha is my meditation teacher? You very rarely hear that, don't you? Uh, people don't say that for some reason. And yet, of course, it all comes from the Buddha. That's where it all stems from. Uh, all these other traditions exist because of the Buddha. So it goes back to him. Uh, and there is a lot of really good uh, and practical information to be found in the suttas. Uh. So when you go on a retreat like this, uh, and you find, you find yourself at ease and at peace in this environment, and you find yourself, you know, uh, the mind calms down and all these things. Uh, because you calm down and you feel at ease, uh, then when you hear the suttas, uh, they go in much more deeply. Uh, they sort of say something to you which otherwise you wouldn't hear. Uh, and then when you hear the suttas in a deeper way, uh, then you find that you actually, uh, your meditation practice becomes more powerful in turn. Uh, so these things go together, right? Uh, these are not separate things. It's not like one is intellectual pursuit and the other one is the pursuit of the path. Uh, these go together, right? They're supposed to be one whole. And then when it is one whole, that is when it actually works. Uh, and this is why I like to, when I do these kind of retreats, I like to focus on practical issues. Uh, how do we do things? How do we practice the path? Uh, and not so much on theoretical things. Of course, if theoretical things arise, uh, that's wonderful too. Uh, but practical things are more important. 
Okay, I think that's all I want to say for uh, the introduction. Uh, so now I want to say just a few words about uh, meditation practice uh, and how to go about, how to spend your time wisely on this retreat. And uh, one of the uh, kind of basic things, as I mentioned before, is to have a sense of ease and relaxedness uh, and actually enjoying yourself while you're here. This is very important. Uh, this is, if this doesn't work, if you don't find yourself enjoying uh, the meditation, then it's not going to come together. It's as simple as that. Uh, and very often people, when they think about meditation practice, uh, they think about methods of meditation, they think about watching the breath or uh, doing a mantra or watching the feelings in the body or metta or whatever. Uh, so think about meditation as being some kind of method. Uh, but really, remember that the meditation is not so much the method. Uh, meditation is whatever leads to the right kind of result, right? Uh, what we're aiming for with meditation practice is to become more peaceful, uh, uh, to become more uh, kind inside, to become more at ease and all these kind of things. Uh, this is the real purpose of meditation. Uh, and only uh, when uh, you use a meditation object and it leads to these qualities, uh, only then uh, is the meditation object right. Uh, so meditation object is secondary. Uh, it is the results, what we're trying to achieve is much more important. And if you keep that in mind, then you have a guide throughout your meditation. You know whether you're doing the right thing. Uh, you don't just mechanically watch the breath. Uh, you don't just mechanically do, say, you know, all may all beings be, be happy. Uh, and it doesn't really do anything. Uh, you actually notice whether the mind is moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, and if it is, uh, then you know that the meditation object is right. Uh, and what this means is that when you sit down on your seat, you don't sort of sit down, close your eyes, and start watching the breath straight away. Uh, you make sure that your mind is ready for watching the breath. Uh, and this is one of the foundations, it's very important, because if the mind isn't ready, uh, then you can try as you might, but you're not actually going to be able to uh, follow the breath in any uh, um, good way. Not only the breath, any other kind of meditation technique you wish to do uh, is not going to work unless the mind is right. Uh, and that rightness of mind is basically a mind of mindfulness, right? Mindfulness means being present, you are here, uh, uh, it means having a sense of clarity. Uh, you're not confused about what's going on. Uh, and when you're present uh, and you have a sense of clarity, uh, there isn't much thinking going on in your mind, uh, then uh, mindfulness is fairly strong. And then uh, you're able to do the meditation practice. Uh, that is kind of a sign that you're doing, doing well, you're on the right spot. Uh, and then you find that whatever object you use, uh, it will actually work. Uh. So this is a kind of basic guideline. So how do we go about doing this? What is like the, some ways of achieving that mindfulness which makes uh, meditation possible? Uh, and there are some very simple guidelines to follow uh, to do this. Uh, and the first one is to get the body out of the way. Uh, meditation is about mental development, mental training. It does not concern the body. Uh, the body is really quite irrelevant. Uh, so we want to get the body out of the way. Uh, this is one of the basic things. Uh, so to be able to do that, the first thing to do is to ensure uh, that the body is comfortable uh, when you meditate. And that means that uh, whether you sit on the floor uh, or you sit on the chair or you, you know, you, <laughs> uh, whatever you do, uh, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as the body is comfortable, you're doing the right thing. And there's no need to sit cross-legged on the floor if you're more comfortable on the chair. Uh, what matters is that you are at ease. Uh, and the way you know that is that when you uh, relax, you close your eyes, uh, and the body is not a problem anymore, uh, then you know that you're heading in the right direction. Uh, the body is disappearing. Uh, if you find that during your meditation practice uh, that you get pains uh, uh, in the body anywhere, in the legs, is, you know, it's quite common to get pains. Uh, the back is quite common to get pains in meditation practice. Those are probably the two worst kind of areas. Uh, if you find you get pains, then don't uh, try to sort of tough it out too much. Uh, if it is a persistent pain, then do something else. Change your posture, take a seat, uh, take a chair if you like, uh, uh, do some walking meditation, uh, whatever it is, do what is required so the pain doesn't become a problem. The pain is a problem when you, the mind focuses on the pain, right? It goes back to the pain. You're not able to let it go and just let it be. Uh, but the mind is kind of obsessed with that pain, so it goes back there all the time. Uh, of course, a little bit of pain is 
it has to be there. You have to have some kind of some pain in the body. The body is never going to be absolutely relaxed uh, for long periods of time. Uh, but uh, uh, when that pain becomes something which obsesses the mind, then uh, you have to sort of do something uh, to get away from that. Uh. So that is the first thing to keep in mind. And it's actually a very important thing because I think there is a tendency among uh, almost in any culture, I think, uh, to think that if you have pain, if something hurts and it's kind of good for you, uh, then you're moving in the right direction. Uh, and maybe the part of that is because we think that if you have pain, uh, then you counteract the desires perhaps or something like that. Uh, so pain somehow is a spiritual thing. It can sort of help you develop the mind. Uh, but this is the basic thing the Buddha talks about in the middle way of practice, uh, that pain uh, is to be avoided. This is called the Atta Kilamatanu Yoga, the uh, pursuit of the tormenting of the body uh, or the tormenting of oneself. Uh, so this is to be avoided. Uh. So keep that in mind throughout this retreat. Uh, don't pursue pain. This is the first, first one. Very simple meditation instruction, but very important. Uh, and it's surprising how many people don't follow that basic meditation instruction. So that is the first one. Uh, and the other one uh, is the uh, sensual indulgence, right? Uh, is the opposite side. The middle way is the halfway between the uh, tormenting of the body uh, and sensual indulgence on the other hand. Uh, so in a place like this, it's very hard to really indulge too much uh, because it's a fairly uh, simple, uh, it's comfortable, uh, but it's relatively simple anyway. Uh, so by just following the routine and doing the right things, uh, uh, there will be, uh, you should be okay, there shouldn't be any problem. You don't have to worry so much about the sensual side, uh, it's more the pain side uh, that is more important. Uh. So, when you meditate, uh, that is where you start off. And very often when you start off your meditation practice, start off by feeling the body. Uh. The body is at ease, uh, you are relaxed, uh, no tensions. Uh. And even that, even when the body is completely relaxed, that's already quite nice, right? Uh. And then from there, when the body is relaxed, uh, then you move on to the mind. So what about the mind? And the mind is, once the body is relaxed then, you focus on the mind instead. And the mind can be regarded in a similar way to the body. We're trying to find the middle way of the mind. So the middle way of the mind means, on the one hand, not, uh, no essential indulgence, right? Or sensual thinking. Yeah? And this is uh, something that happens to almost to anybody who goes on retreat. Uh, sometimes you will have thoughts about the past, right? About the life at home where you have your kind of ordinary sensual pleasures, obviously, because you are changing so abruptly from the, from the ordinary household life uh, to coming on a retreat. Uh, it's natural that some of those tendencies and habits uh, will recur uh, on a retreat like this. Uh. And uh, there is a classic example of this in the mention in the suttas by the Buddha. And this is the example of Lady Visakha. She's one of the main supporters of the Buddha uh, at the time, uh, two and a half thousand years ago. And she went to the Buddha and said, I wish to practice the Uposatha observance. The Uposatha observance is what you do every fortnight. Uh, and you go to the monastery perhaps, and you then practice the eight precepts in the monastery. Uh, and she asked the Buddha, how can I practice this observance so that it is of great fruit and great benefit? Uh, and then the Buddha says, well, what you should not be doing uh, is sitting there and contemplating all the things. Tomorrow I'm going to be free of these eight precepts. Uh, I'm going to be free of this torture, having to keep these eight precepts. Uh, so tomorrow I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this kind of food. I'm going to enjoy myself in this way. I'm going to do all these kind of things. Uh, yes, the Buddha said, this is not the right way of practicing the posita. If you do it that way, huh, it's not going to be of much fruit or benefit for you. Huh? So what is the right way? And the right way, said so the Buddha, is to find that middle way again in the mind. Uh, and what specifically he talks about in that connection uh, is doing the uh, recollection of the Buddha to give rise to a sense of joy inside. And that joy uh, that you get from things like recollecting the Buddha, that is precisely the middle way in meditation practice. So the one problem is then the, uh, the sensual indulgence, and the other one is like having a more like a painful mind state, right? Just like when the body is painful. For example, if you get upset about something, yeah, you may have thoughts about the household life or, or life back home uh, when you're here. Sometimes you're going to get upset about things. You're going to remember something which is unpleasant, right? Uh, this is just the way things are. Yeah? And you feel a bit upset about something. Yeah? So that is the other thing yeah, you have to avoid. Uh, 
How do you avoid that? And again, the interesting thing in the suttas is one thing I want to emphasize on this retreat, uh, that to overcome thoughts that are about sensuality or about upset or whatever it is, uh, it is the wisdom quality, the reflection, that is the most important aspect of overcoming these things. Uh, it is not using willpower or forcing yourself on the meditation object, uh, but actually thinking, uh, reflecting in such a way uh, that you overcome these problems. Uh, and again, with anger, it isn't, or upset, it isn't that difficult. Uh, sometimes you just have to have some little tools in the back of your mind that you can use when these things happen. Uh. So that is one way, that is one kind of painful mind state, right? So that is not the middle way, that's one extreme. Another painful mind state is using too much willpower in your meditation practice. And this happens because the mind isn't ready. If the mind isn't ready to watch the meditation object, then the only way that you're going to be able to stick with the meditation object is by using willpower. But willpower tires you out. You know what it's like if you go to work and you have to concentrate on something, you have to force your mind onto something which isn't really pleasant, you have to write a report or read something which isn't nice, you know what it's like. And what it's like is that after a while you're really exhausted and tired because you have to use willpower to force yourself to do the task at hand. And in meditation it's exactly the same thing. If the meditation object isn't something you like or enjoy, and part of that is the mind isn't ready for watching the, the object, then uh, you're going to have to force the mind onto the breath. You're going to have to force the mind onto the metta, onto the mantra, whatever it is. Uh, and because you're forcing the mind, after a while you feel tired. Uh, you feel, you know, the mind just doesn't want to do it anymore. And when the mind feels tired, it rebels, it gets even more restless, and then you get into this rut, this negative way of, uh, uh, which doesn't actually work, which isn't the middle way uh, between the two extremes. Uh, so again, uh, with this, in this kind of case, what you have to do uh, is you just have to wait, you have to be patient, uh, and you have to allow things to calm down, to become peaceful. Uh, particularly if you come from a busy life, uh, you just, it's Friday night today, people are often quite tired on Friday night, uh, so we'll see if any of you fall asleep in the meditation afterwards, it would be interesting, it's very common, don't feel bad if you fall asleep, it's perfectly okay. Uh, but uh, this is often what happens because you're tired, right? Uh, so allow yourself to be tired, allow yourself to be what you are. Don't use force in the meditation. Uh, sit back and just be an observer. Uh, and this is one of the tricks to actually be able to achieve uh, that sense of the middle way, uh, is to just be an observe, passive observer in the meditation practice. Not to do anything, uh, but to accept yourself for what you are. Accept the tiredness, accept the restlessness, accept the thinking, uh, even the thoughts you don't like. We all have thoughts we don't like sometimes, right? Uh, accept that. Uh, this is just nature, just allow things to go. Uh, and when you learn to be a passive observer, uh, what you're doing is you're taking the willpower, the will out of the meditation practice. Uh, and when you take the will out of it, the will is the thing which, which always does things, right? Trying to control here, trying to control there. Uh, by pulling, by accepting things. Uh, acceptance is the opposite of willpower. Uh, so then, no willpower, things start to calm down and become peaceful. Uh, and that is the right way. So this is the first thing to do, is just to allow things uh, to calm down by themselves, by being a passive observer, just seeing things, you know, whatever ha is happening, just observing it as it is, uh, without reacting to it. Uh, the second aspect of the middle way, uh, as I mentioned before, is the idea of joy, uh, getting joy in your meditation practice. Uh, and the joy that we're talking about here is joy that comes from uh, the good action that you have done in the past, uh, from the generosity, from reflection on the Buddha, any kind of joy which comes from this, the spiritual uh, uh, side of things, that is the kind of joy we're talking about here. Uh. And that is the spiritual joy here. Uh. And when you get into that, when you're able to give rise to some joy, then that is a very good sign that you're on the right path. This is exactly the middle way here. Uh. And that joy uh, is the beginning of any meditation which is going to take you to deep states of samadhi. Samadhi is this idea of stillness of the mind, profound meditation, right? Uh, so if you get the joy is a sign that you're heading in the right direction. That is always a very good sign. Uh. And then as you practice like this, you just sit there, you're peaceful, just enjoying the peace, and just thinking how wonderful it is uh, to be able to come to a meditation center like this, uh, and what, what a wonderful thing it is to be part of a group of people who actually practice like this, good people, uh, kind people like this. Uh, 
how wonderful that is. And then you feel a sense of joy, uh, your mind becomes peaceful, uh, and then when you are ready to watch the breath, the breath is just there by itself, uh, and you start watching the breath. Uh, and it's very natural, it's very easy, no willpower is required, uh, and it happens by itself. Uh, and then uh, the meditation becomes very beautiful. Uh. Okay, so that is just an introduction uh, to meditation practice, and uh, what I will do, I will, as it says here, there will be two, one guided meditation now and another one tomorrow, and this will just reinforce the kind of ideas that I've been giving you now. Uh, so we'll do a short guided meditation. I should also say that this schedule that we have here uh, is really, it's up to you whether you want to follow it or not. Uh, it's not an absolute schedule. Uh, so if you feel a schedule is good for you, please follow it. If you feel you want to you know, do whatever, that's fine as well. It's really up to you. It's your retreat. Uh, you can do exactly as you like. Uh, if you don't want to come and listen to my talks, that's fine as well. Uh, it's really, you can do exactly as you, as you like, uh, as long as you stay within the eight precepts, really. Uh. Okay, so let's do a bit of meditation, and we'll do a bit of sutta reading afterwards. Uh. <coughs> 